Hey guys. I don't have any more hair left here, so I can't flip it. I cut my own hair uh, this weekend because I didn't have time to go to a hair salon and I did it without a mirror in the back, so the back's kind of crooked, but hey, you gotta be efficient with your time. Couldn't make it through a hair salon. So today's lesson of the day, uh, it is funny how things come in patterns. So this pattern of today with all the consults that I saw, God knows how many, was people were asking me like, how old should you be when you do a facelift? And uh, I went through with different patients for different reasons, trying to explain to them like uh, the ages that I see and why I recommend a facelift as well as telling people why not to do a facelift because they were told a lot of people by other surgeons that they should do a facelift and I thought they shouldn't or uh, someone else told them that they shouldn't do a facelift but I thought 100% they should. So um, let's go over that. So the average age for a facelift nowadays is about 45 to 55 years old. Uh, the old facelifts were called rhytidectomies, which means they were like pulling on skin and uh, removing wrinkles. Hi, Matt Rondo. So they were uh, pulling away skin and uh, removing wrinkles. No longer is that the case. Now uh, we are doing soft tissue lifts. So they're more of a real facelift rather than a rhytidectomy. So removal of wrinkles, which means our whole goal now, rather than to like pull and stretch and do all this, is to reposition the soft tissues, all the soft tissues, not just the skin. So uh, if you're not a doctor or you're a bad doctor, you think that we're just made up of skin, collagen, and fat. Like somehow those are the only things that compute. Uh, most of the face is made up of water probably and uh, a mixture of all these other cells. So uh, all that stuff needs to get lifted when it goes down, not just the skin. Uh, similarly in the neck, you get the biggest improvements from movement of the muscles at the base to, to tighten up the base of the neck. So all this falls into this new type of lifting we call deep plane lifting. And by new, I mean the past you know, 15 years, it's been more and more popularized. And deep plane is the only real logical way to do a facelift. And you would disagree with that if you don't know how to do it, but that's the reality of it. Once you do deep plane facelifting, there is no other way. There is no situation where you say, ah, let me just do skin because they're younger. Oh, let me just do a little plication. Once you know how to do a deep plan as a surgeon, you realize it really is the only logical way because you are going in the glide plane where the face droops in the most and you release the muscle planes from each other and then you reposition them back up. So that's the whole idea of it. Because of this, um, you don't look at facelifting anymore, or I don't look at it as an age-related thing. Yes, there's an average, 45 to 55, but I don't look at it like that. I look at it as a mechanical thing. So I look at someone's face and I say, you know what, nothing else is gonna get them the result they need, not skin tightening, not volumization, um, certainly you know, not threads. And the only thing that's gonna get them there is this, is this physical movement. And if you look at that and say, this is the physical movement I need, and the doctor agrees with you, you're a candidate for a facelift. Um, the uh, other thing that I heard is a patient asked me that she had met this patient who would go to Korea and do a facelift every few years. They would just do a little tuck, little tuck, little tuck, and that's how they maintain looking amazing. We call that serial facelifting, which I think was published by uh, Frank Kamer back like 30 years ago. And the idea of that is um, they were doing smaller facelifts at the time, some applications, and they would, really fall down after two, three years and you just keep repeating it. And I explained to her, no, um, in this world now, uh, you'd wanna do it once and do it the right way and just get a bigger improvement and that way it lasts you like 10 years. So if you're gonna do that, you do the deep plane. And just to make sure everyone understands deep plane, what this means is you're not pulling, stretching, tightening in any way. You're not pulling skin, you're not tightening muscle. There's none of those words. You're releasing and repositioning. So you go in under the skin up to here, then you jump down into the deeper layer, which is where the muscles glide over each other. So if you realize you have different layers of muscles, you have your jaw clenching, you have your smiling muscles, you have your platysma. None of these muscles are connected. They overlap each other. And for them to move independently of each other, uh, there has to be a glide plane. That's the glide plane that we're going into. So we're going into that plane where they naturally glide, separate them, reposition and put it down. This gives a natural result that lasts longer and gives a bigger improvement. So if you're gonna do someone young, you similarly do this deep plane facelift. You do someone old, you do this deep plane. And deep plane, 
You could do a little tiny deep plane that doesn't make any difference, or you could do a big giant deep plane, which makes a bigger difference, which is actually faster. Um, it is not more dangerous. It doesn't have more risk. It actually looks better. You get a bigger improvement. So uh, it it's, goes against what most people think about facelifting. So ages uh, 25, you can do a facelift if it's for acne or physically droopy cheeks that nothing else can lift. Age 85, you can do it, but you generally stop operating on some people at some age. What age is that? There's no number. You have to walk into the room, look at the patient and see how energetic they are. If it's a patient who's sprightly, who has a lot of energy um, and is not walking around on uh, crutches, then you can do a facelift. If they're walking around on crutches or they really don't have a lot of energy, it's not a good idea because people at that age can't tolerate a big surgery. They're not gonna go through it. They're gonna maybe get a little delirious. Uh, they can have big problems from it because their bodies can't handle the insult. Uh, so that's how I look at it as far as age limitation in the older age range. And at that point you say, listen, you're a beautiful grandma, accept the way you look, your grandkids love it. I'd rather you live than me do anything bad to you. So uh, that's how I determine the high end of age, the low end of age, it's all mechanical. So I'm looking to see, is there anything else I can do? Um, and there is a recommendation at 85, just take a Viagra and roll with it. It is an option. So, you know, Viagra is great. Um, so lifting you can do for acne. It's one of the biggest improvements you can make on acne. You can do it for droopy cheeks. You can do it for droopy neck, droopy chin. You could do it with a shorter chin. You can do it for all this kind of stuff. Now, why don't you do facelifts? What is a contraindication for a facelift? One contraindication is, uh, somebody who you do this to, and it doesn't change that much, then what's the point of doing it? Go do a skin tightening, go get a little filler if you want, go do something else. Don't waste your time doing a surgery. Everything you do can have a risk. Filler can have a risk, surgery can have a risk. So when you're doing it, make sure it's worth it. Filler doesn't have a lot of downtime, surgery does. So if you're gonna do surgery, it's gotta be worth it. You don't do it for this tiny little, it's a big surgery to do a facelift. Ian, you don't listen to somebody who thinks they can minimize your facelift by doing a mini lift because what's gonna happen is mini lift, mini result, maximum scar. That's the motto, understand that. If you do just a small little thing and pull, you have a lot of tension on that little incision and it's gonna scar worse because it starts pulling down and anywhere you have tension, you're gonna scar. So, uh, and the result goes away. So these mini lifts are generally uh, not great. There is a mini lift version that I do called a weekend lift which is not really a mini lift, it's, it's really a targeted lift of the neck, which just means you don't cut away skin, you go in under the skin and you grab the muscle and you tighten the muscle up. And if you see, that's what I need. Either way, that's the mini. So contraindications, number one, somebody is not gonna get a big improvement for it, uh, from it, don't do it. It doesn't, uh, no, now that's me. I do big facelifts, I can get big results and I can do more than most people can. There are surgeons, and this happened today, where the surgeon just was unable to get this person what they wanted. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I'm able to do it. That surgeon wasn't. But he had told her, no, it's impossible, rather than saying, hey, uh, he's not aware. Maybe there's this guy in Beverly Hills that you can go to and he can do it for you. Uh, so you should go see him and ask him and see what he says. And she found me on her own and she came and uh, what that guy said is correct in his hands. So it's not an insult when she asked me, well, was he wrong? I say, well, he's not wrong um, in his hands and that kind of facelift. It's not gonna give you a big improvement, but you found me and I've seen your face a thousand times and here's some examples of other people who look just like you and you can see I can do it, no problem, reproducibly. Um, you have to be able to do things, these things reproducibly. We go to all these lectures and people show their best photos and everyone's like, oh my God, wow. And you see like two patients who got a really good result from this thing they've done. Um, those never impress me because I need to see hundreds of results. When I give my talks, I fly through the lecture because I like to throw up 30 recent photos so they realize when I'm doing this, I'm doing it reproducibly. I'm doing it over and over and over again on someone who's 600 pounds, 500 pounds, 100 pounds, black, white, Asian, revision, primary, it doesn't matter. Whatever obstacle course, we can get to that. So. Either way, a contraindication for one surgeon might not be a contraindication for another surgeon. And in those cases, you hope the surgeons are more open-minded and they know what's out there and they just refer you to another surgeon for uh, a recommendation. So next part, um, contraindications that are major ones. Smoking, smoking, uh, there are research studies um, that show that you can do deep plane lifts on a smoker 
and you have a very, very low risk of anything happening. But this is for major complications. Now, if a smoker even avoids a major complication, they can also get minor complications, which means minor wound healing issues, hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, prolonged healing, prolonged edema, swelling. And all these things can happen with smoking or with nicotine. So if you smoke a cigarette, there's two things that we worry about. Number one is the toxins, the oxygen radicals and all that kind of stuff that's in the tobacco as it's getting burned, that's going through your body. And this is attacking your immune system and attacking the cells that are healing and it's causing inflammation and it causes all these problems. The other is the nicotine. Nicotine causes vasoconstriction. It constricts the blood vessels. And when you do a large flap surgery, you're insulting or you are hurting the blood flow to the face. And the body needs to push blood back into it from this side to that side and then grow uh, new blood supply through the incision. So when you take nicotine, whether it is a cigarette, chewing gum, uh, vapes, that kind of stuff, you are causing vasoconstriction and you can cause a big problem with uh, vascularity to the, to, the, to the flap. Now, some surgeons say, well, I do a smoker, I put uh, nitric oxide paste on there. So they put nitric paste or nitrobid paste and that is a venous dilator. It dilates the outflow vessels more than the inflow vessels. The uh, problem with this is that it hasn't been shown to work. So uh, it does help revascularize tissues faster sometimes, just like minoxidil can. Uh, it can cause a little bit of decrease in inflammation somehow because of the, 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 the nitric paste, uh, but it also lowers your systemic blood pressure. So if your blood pressure drops to uh, 100 systolic, you're not gonna have good perfusion pressure pumping to those distal regions. So even though you relax the veins and you get less congestion, you don't have the capillary flow theoretically. So that's a concern, which means you cannot control uh, what's gonna happen with a smoker. And some people try to use triamterine. Triamterine is a uh, medicine that you give somebody to make their blood cells less sticky so they can get in through smaller spaces. Um, may help, may not. Either way, because of those reasons, not for the major risks, the minor risks, I don't operate on smokers or people who uh, are taking nicotine. Now, this is mainly for facelifting. For more minor procedures, they are a little more resilient and they can heal better and it's fine. Lip lifts, no way. The inflammatory response on the incision is not good and I have to end up fixing it for another year. So uh, I don't like to operate on smokers for that reason. I make them quit and the way to make them quit is at least two weeks before, at least two weeks after. I want at least one month before, at least one month after, but it's hard to control people from smoking because it's a really bad addiction. The other thing that you help uh, that helps us is Chantix or Wellbutrin, and I think you can combine the two, but I don't like prescribing those because I don't deal with them that often. So I send it to their primary care doctor and I say, please ask them if they can give you Chantix or Wellbutrin. Other contraindications. Here's one that is more of a, um, one that I do to save myself. So I don't wanna operate on somebody who has been overfilled with fat or overfilled with filler. And these are two different things. So. Uh, not regular filler. So regular filler is fine. It's not a big deal. But if you can see the filler in someone's face and their face doesn't move and they're big giant chipmunk cheeks, you don't want to operate on this person. Certain things are going to happen. Number one, when you operate on somebody with filler or fat, if they're overfilled, you're not going to be able to lift them very far because their face is overexpanded. They are already lifted in another sense. They're not lifted vertically. They are lifted uh, laterally. So you're expanded outwards and it's really hard to get a vertical lift on these people. So their lift, when you look at the before and after, is unimpressive. And they are already a little off um, in terms of how they view reality because they walked around with this fake face without realizing it. And when you give them this result, even though it's the most you could ever do, they will not appreciate the fact that no more could have been done because they have an overfilled face. And you'll never be able to talk someone out of that. So uh, a lot of caution should be taken operating on somebody with an overfilled face. The other problem is the tissues are damaged and patients don't understand that. Some do, but patients generally don't understand that. When the face is overfilled with filler, filler usually sits in the SMAS plane and expands it or it sits on the bone um, as well. And when it's in the SMAS plane or the sub-SMAS or the super-SMAS or the hypodermis and it causes expansion, it's a microcystic expansion, which means there's all these tiny little gel beads that are sitting throughout the face in different layers and they've stretched out these tiny little areas that are like this, they're linear, 
um, in the SMAS, it stretched them out into balls. And when you operate on somebody and you don't dissolve them, it can creep out. It can fall out of those places and those collapse. Um, then what happens is when they're healing, the metabolism of the filler increases in the face, but it doesn't increase at the same rate in all parts. So what happens is they can get indentations in parts where the metabolism increased or filler crept out. And you end up with all these indents in their face after you do a facelift. And guess who's responsible for fixing that for the next two years? It's you. So you have to keep refilling them because they got collapsed. Now, uh, patients are often wrongly under the, it's the false impression that fat grafting can replace the filler damage. That is not correct because filler causes expansion in multiple layers and then it collapses. Fat is larger molecule, cannot go into the multiple layers like a filler can, cannot replace the mass hydration or expansion that uh, filler does. So when you do fat injections to replace it, unless you over inject somebody and blow them out, you're never going to get back the same exact contour you had with a filler. So fat cannot replace filler. It is not physically possible to do that when somebody is um, soaked like a sponge in their face with filler. It goes out and then you try to fill it back with these little bits of cheese. So one is soaked like a sponge, the other one's like layers of cheese that you kind of put out throughout the face, however you want to think about it. It's cheese because it's yellow. So um, be very, very cautious. So for me, that's a contraindication if somebody is overfilled. Now, if they can get dissolved beforehand safely, and they look okay, then I'll do the surgery. The problem is when somebody is overfilled massively and for over a year, there is no fixing that in most cases, meaning they are already damaged, they are already stretched out. Once somebody is stretched like that in multiple layers, no matter what you do, you cannot fully fix it. It's been stretched, it's like stretch marks. You can't fix stretch marks. So the issue that you see when you send them to dissolve is that since they're already damaged, when you dissolve them, they get this exaggerated dissolving. So the dissolver uh, looks like it really collapses them and it's because they were stretched out so far. The other thing is the tissue is damaged itself and the ability to regenerate hyaluronic acid diminishes for whatever reason. So the dissolver also um, gets rid of some of their own hyaluronic and it just becomes a mess. So they're really hard to dissolve. So I don't like operating on overfilled faces for those reasons. It is very unpredictable. However, if somebody is able to dissolve before coming to me and do it way beforehand so they have a time to rehydrate in their face, then fantastic. If it's an overfilled fat face, um, there are certain situations where you can do liposuction to remove some of the fat, but it is nearly impossible to do it predictably because when you liposuction someone's face, uh, you're at a high risk of causing irregularities. And if you're gonna liposuction the face, sometimes it'll take the healthy fat, sometimes it'll take the grafted fat. You don't know which fat it's gonna take. It could take the natural fat or the other one. If it takes the natural fat, you end up with all these kind of irregularities from the other fat. So um, I don't like doing uh, facelifts if they're over fat grafted, sometimes I will and I'll reduce it a little bit. And the other one that's really, really hard if someone's had liposuction all over their face. You're not supposed to do liposuction in the face. And I've said this over and over again, and uh, obviously not everyone listens to me, but uh, you don't wanna do liposuction in the face. If you do liposuction in the face, or you do those wands in the face, there's a very, very high rate of irregularities. You can damage the smas layer and you can damage the fat. And what that does is it changes the color of the face. You end up getting dark indentations everywhere that you have defects and it can change the way the face moves because the skin just starts to collapse onto itself because it's not supported anymore. So you get all these like weird indentations that happen around here. So um, when I'm doing surgery on those kind of patients for a facelift, I do warn them saying I can't fully fix it. There are things I cannot fully fix and I will do some fat grafting to try to make it better. I'll do some nano fat to try to make it better. Later, you're gonna have to do some radio frequency. Later, you're gonna have to do some filler. And I tell them there, it's impossible to fully get it better. So um, that is that. So other contraindications, well, there are so many, but we'll leave it at that. Either way, I think we covered a good bit about facelifts. Hope this helps anybody. Uh, we'll answer a couple of questions here. So why would you need a facelift for acne? Happy birthday, thank you. So uh, facelift for acne is because with acne patients, they end up usually getting very dense uh, tissue in the front of their face and they have a bunch of rolling scars. Um, rolling scars are ice picks. 
there's an accordion effect that uh, most of them occur here on the anterior cheek more than the lateral. And there's an accordion effect where when the skin is down like this, they look deeper and darker. And you can laser them, you can subsize them, you can do TCA cross, you can do a million things to try to make acne better. And they all give a, a, a gradual kind of improvement or incremental improvement. But if you lift somebody, you end up, first of all, moving it off the front of the face, out of the way a little bit, so it's less visible. Uh, but the other thing is you cause distension of these scars. They're no longer accordion like this. They're kind of stretched out. So they end up looking better and it becomes more responsive to the, the other things. Um, what about scar tissue from sculpture? So scar tissue from sculpture is not a contraindication to doing a facelift. And often and very commonly, you will come across that scarring. What the scarring looks like is fat, but yellow. Oh, sorry, but gray. So fat is yellow, sculpture, fibrotic granules or uh, granulation tissue is this grayish tissue that looks similar to fat. So uh, the appropriate place to really inject sculpture is somewhere deep in the face in between, in that deep plane uh, or in this mass if you wanted to, but, but really in that layer and you let it sit there and it granulates, meaning it forms scar tissue and that's how you get bulks. Sculpture is not a filler. It's not a filler uh, in the sense that you don't go add a gel uh, or a um, uh, another material as volume to fill or contour something. It is for diffuse volumization. So for somebody who has um, adipose atrophy, like so fat atrophy in their face or lipodystrophy or deflation, things like that, uh, you can put it diffusely and it can build up bulk. And when you come across it in the face of, not a big deal. You go across it. Threads when you come across them, not a big deal. Uh, you do sometimes see like really nasty like permanent threads that replace all around the nerves and things like that. So you just have to be careful. It doesn't mean you can't do the facelift, but it does limit things on the facelift. So you do want to warn your patient saying sometimes uh, we're limited. Is it safe to do lipo on the neck? Yeah, it's safe. But to give you an idea of how much lipo, I, so I perform six facelifts a week and I perform lipo once a month. So it is uncommon. Most people do not have that much fat in there. And you do want to keep a fat layer in the neck, not as much as mine, but you do want to keep a fat layer in the neck so the skin stays a normal color. And so you have some kind of camouflage over the muscle. If you don't have anything between the skin and the muscle, you're going to have bands no matter what. You're going to see the muscles rippling there in the neck. And most people don't like that. It's also a darker color skin if you don't have any fat because the light reflects through the dermis to the platysma and then back to your eye. So you see darker skin. Um, so for that reason, I'm very cautious about how much uh, lipo I do. And sometimes I do lipo contouring, meaning I'm already open. I just do a little trimming of fat or melting of fat, but I always leave a nice layer of fat on the skin side. And most uh, of the more experienced facelift surgeons, uh, they, they do that. So let's see some questions. What is the best layer to ablate periorbital veins in the under eye? Um, so... I don't do any of the periorbital vein ablation. I send it to Ivan Brooks. He's over at Beverly Hills Vein Institute and he does it and he tells people, I, I don't really don't know the risks or anything like that. So how long after getting threads can you get a face or neck lift? Uh, you can get a face neck lift really anytime after threads, but if there's any irregularity or anything like that, I tell people just wait a couple months, let it mellow out. The threads will usually stay there. Uh, if there are PDO threads, six, to, six months to nine months, there will be some of those fibers in there. And they do cause scar tissue formation, just like Sculptra can, um, just depending on the number of threads that you place in. If they're superficial, you see them. If they're deeper, uh, you, you typically don't see them. So do you need to be put under for a lip lift and aura lift? No, you could do it awake or you could do it under IV twilight anesthesia. What's the deal with the new car? I'm getting jealous of the new car. So it's a dream car. It's a 1995 F512M and it's the greatest thing in the world. Thank you for being obsessed with it like I am. Ritu Chopra, I'm tired. <laughs> Me too. All right. So I think we got through a lot of questions. And fantastic. All right. I will sign off now. I got another video I will put up later uh, regarding this cool uh, couple lip lifts. Uh, dimple plasty. Is that a question? Dimple plasty. I don't like dimple plasty. So um, I think there are certain things that we should not chase. One of them is dimples. I have had a lot of people come into reverse dimpleplasty and not that many people get dimpleplasty. That makes me think there's a high rate of dissatisfaction, not in the beginning, but after years. You can never create a real dimple. A dimple is a form of muscle retardation that you have in the cheek. 
and the way we form a dimple or surgeons form a dimple is kind of like piercing your cheek and then to connect the inside and the outside uh, layers through the natural layers that are there, uh, it never looks fully natural. So um, I don't like the way it looks. It's usually in the wrong position and people end up getting rid of it. Now, uh, I also see people with cheek piercings who end up with a dimpleplasty automatically and they want to reverse it. And it's reversible, but it's a big cut that you have to make. It's not a small thing. So I don't like dimpleplasty because uh, I don't think it's a natural thing. I don't think it's a necessary thing. I don't think anybody has been made prettier by it. And I, you know, I, I don't always care what the patient wants. Like I like to make things look pretty and I have good taste. And I, I sometimes disagree with people who have bad taste. So I don't care if the patient comes to me and says, I really, really want this done. If I think it looks terrible, my taste to me matters more. So um, I do this because I like what I do and I like to make things look nice and I would lose my mind if I ever made things not, not look nice or not have, not, not be able to fix something. And dimpleplasty is one of those things where I don't think it ever looks that good and fixing it is not very easy. So <clears throat> for that reason, I'm against it. So um, that's all. I hope everybody has a good night and it is 8.45 p.m. and I'm getting out of here.